another episode of Ask a Pianist. My name is Andrew Ahrens, and today we're going to look into an area of interpretation that can be rather confusing. The music of Johann Sebastian Bach is remarkable for many reasons, one of them being the extreme emphasis on abstract counterpoint and logical harmonic movement. Due to the nature of this kind of construction, you have music that essentially can be played by any instrument, at any speed, with any combination of dynamics and articulation. The music is very, very difficult to destroy. This openness of interpretation possibilities is obvious to any student who has listened to different recordings of the same work by Bach. And the question which tends to come up is one that I've been asked very often, and that we'll focus on today. When we're playing a piece by Bach, how do we know what tempo to choose? The most common tempo ranges that are generally agreed upon are the dance movements we find in suites. Sarabans are traditionally slow, Allemands moderately faster, Courants faster than that, and Gigues being the fastest. The determination of the speeds comes from research into the actual court dances that have these rhythmic combinations. This episode, however, is not going to focus on those dances. There's more than enough academic literature that covers that subject. What I'd like to focus on are pieces that are not overtly or directly tied to dance movements. In addition to the suites, we have the two books of Preludes and Fugues. These pieces are so varied and diverse in their musical material that they constitute perhaps the greatest collection written by Bach for a single manualed instrument. The examples we'll look at today all come from the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Let's first look at a typical fast piece of Bach. The greatest indicators of tempo that are common to all Bach pieces are the rate and complexity of harmonic change. In this piece, most of the time we have a single harmony for each bar. Occasionally, for dramatic purposes, he'll speed the harmonic change rate up and increase the harmonic complexity, but he usually does this as a melodic sequence. In other words, he'll repeat gestures but pattern them according to a linear pitch direction. In other words, we could argue that the harmony is strictly changing on each beat. But the reduced gestural pattern 
is really just a downward moving scale. Aside from this situation, he never changes the harmony under the rhythmic threshold of one harmony per bar. Now, why is it important to consider this in detail when we're choosing a tempo? Well, let's look at a similar situation in a typically slow piece. This is written in the same time signature as the D minor prelude we heard a moment ago. Three quarter time, or three quarter note beats to a bar. However, notice the rate of harmonic change. For the first two bars, we have a harmonic change within the bar, which is already faster than in the D minor. reaches the third bar, he starts changing the harmony on each eighth note, which is twice as fast as the fastest change in the D minor. Now, 
Already we've seen a dramatic increase in the harmonic rate. But what about the harmonic complexity? Well, this opening is still within the usual boundaries of a minor keyed piece. But, as we approach the ending of the piece, we get some wonderfully wild harmonic shifts, which happen at a fast rate. Now, we could say, since Bach never wrote any tempo markings here, there is no reason we can't play it as fast as the D minor prelude we looked at a moment ago. Aside from the technical difficulties, as well as the obvious character shift, the most noticeable thing about this kind of speed is how easily and quickly we move through any dramatic harmonic shifts. They virtually all become passing notes within blocks of traditional harmony. Instead of hearing each harmonic crush in bar 36, for example, it merely sounds like a quick chromatic scale downwards. The harmonic dissonances no longer have a dramatic function. They are reduced to passing notes in a broad gesture only. This reduction comes at a cost. First, the gesture itself, if played slower, serves to highlight the right hand syncopation against the left. This comes from a gesture that appears very early in the piece in the melody. When we break down this gesture, we get a melody that is continuously subverting the stability of the tonic through interruption. In terms of harmony, it's simply 1, 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, 1. right-hand gesture introducing the five chord early rhythmically, we never really get stability on the one chord. These traits of the melody and gesture only work at a slower speed. If you go really fast, the C-sharp becomes part of the tonic chord, and you don't get any sense of interruption or subversion. In other words, we have to play it at a speed wherein the gesture is perceived as being constructed of separate and important entities. And in practical terms, this means we have to play it on the slow end of the spectrum. Bach is very consistent in his writing, 
and when we transfer this speed to the shifts of harmony later on in the piece, we are able to show the audience the complexity in harmonic writing, as well as the now familiar gestural events that, when combined, produce moments of extreme drama in the music. With Bach, the dramatic moments tend to match up with two elements that are very common in his works. The first are cadences, and this includes the lead-up to these cadences, and the second can be found in harmonic progressions, usually designed as a continuous long gestural chain. Essentially, Bach gives you the gestures, the key, and the rhythm at the beginning of the piece, establishing each so that you have a solid frame of reference upon which you can compare the rest of the piece as you go through it. Harmonic shift and distance from the home key can only be noticed by us as listeners if we have enough time to notice it. If it blows by us because it's very fast, then we will miss it entirely because of all the other fast distractions like gestures, rhythms, and articulations. I realize that this sounds like common sense to some of us, but in many ways we may feel that this tempo issue is true, but be unable to identify precisely why. The way I see it, if you can hear and compare harmonic shifts comfortably while simultaneously observing and comparing other elements like gesture, articulation, and dynamics, then you are going at about the right speed. Now, let's return to the fast D minor prelude for a moment. In some ways, it's easier to establish why a slow piece should be slow, but why does this piece seem to work well when it is fast? Well. We know that the harmonic rate of change is slow, so at least we don't have to worry about the listener not picking up on any element of the harmony. But now, let's consider the gestures. Most of this piece is written as extended scales or broken chords. tend to be perceived as single elements. A scale is rather predictable. If we hear this, we're probably expecting this to follow. Similarly, if we hear this, then we're expecting an identical one to follow. This expectation means that we're not really listening to all of the notes in between the beginning and ending of gestures. It's like when we read words on a page. We're more likely to read the first and last letters of a word, filling in the gap in between with the most predictable or likely letters to form the most predictable or likely words given the context. This perception of gestures containing many notes being heard as one single element has an unexpected but understandable result if we play this piece too slowly. We get bored. specific enough reason to play this faster, but it is potentially the end result of a conglomeration of many important elements to consider. Music is fundamentally about change. Bach gives us an idea and then plays around with it. We enjoy it because we notice both the changes and the similarities. If, however, the rate of change is too slow, then our interest is lost. We can argue that the aesthetic of minimalism, as seen in Philip Glass or Steve Reich, suffers from this problem, 
But their solution is to make other elements of their music interesting to the ear. By shifting texture or instrumentation, they can make harmonies that are constant sound like they are changing and developing. In other words, other vectors of sound are still changing fast enough to keep our interest. This doesn't happen in Bach. His gestures and rate of harmonic change are unified throughout the piece, which means that if we play a fast piece too slow, everything in the piece sounds slow. The harmonic progressions can be seen a mile in advance and may not provide any satisfaction when they finally resolve. That's why I say that getting bored isn't specific enough of a reason to play it faster. We can get bored by anything, but if a composer is changing vectors of expression in order to make up for it, at least we can say that we're bored because of our personal preferences and not because of flaws in the piece or performance. That is an entirely different argument. Let's not forget also that, in many ways, we're really reverse engineering the musical intent with regards to tempo. I think it's reasonable to speculate or even assume that Bach, when writing a piece like the D minor prelude, is assuming that it's a fast movement from the get-go. In other words, the speed is not a character indication that is added in after the piece has been written. It's the same procedure when he writes a sarabande or a gigue. Sarabands are slow. Therefore, this new sarabande that Bach will write is also slow. The only difference is that in the preludes, there is usually no label to help us identify the tempo. All of these compositional assumptions actually serve to create all of the elements that we use as pianists to reverse engineer the tempo. Think about it. If Bach is writing a piece that he assumes will be slow, then all of the elements of expression will be built into the piece to function best at that slow tempo. He will have harmonic changes that occur frequently in the bar. He will have space to expose rhythmic gestures and syncopations. And he can write music that allows for the focus on a single element or space in time within the bar. Moment music, in other words. Similarly, if he's writing a piece that he assumes will be fast, then once again, all the elements of expression will be built to function best at a fast tempo. Harmonic change will be infrequent, gestures will have to be large like scales and arpeggios, and the focus may be on changes of texture that are extreme rather than gradual. Both the D minor and F sharp minor preludes can be considered typical examples of generic speeds. One works well when played fast, and one works well when played slow. Fortunately, Bach does not always stick to typical situations. He frequently presents us with more ambiguous tempo problems. One of the most obvious can be found in the A minor prelude. in many different tempi, and the question becomes not what tempo you should choose, but what elements of the interpretation you wish to present to the audience. If you play this on the fast side, then you're essentially highlighting the long-term gestural movements. The first half of the prelude focuses on downward scales. Perhaps Bob.
Bach is being a little ironic, but he ends the section with fast downward scales as well, as if to emphasize the point. The second section is the opposite. He is focusing on upward moving scales. Granted, once Bach re-establishes the main theme in bar 25, he starts to mix up and down, and by the end he presents them both. By playing this faster, we really notice the directional elements of the gestures, and because of their mix and match situation in the second half, we have something of interest to follow throughout the whole piece. On the other hand, if we approach this piece from a slow perspective, then we benefit from the heavy chromaticism that is in every gesture. Sustained chromaticism in Bach is usually a signifier of sadness and despair. This concept is supported academically, and for the most part, I don't see a reason to disagree with it. It certainly works well in this case. The attention is now focused not on the overall lines and direction of gestures, but on the individual chromatic changes and moments that we get. Harmonic dissonance becomes the center of the communication within the piece, and the subtle changes of the intensity of the dissonances is what affects our intellectual and emotional responses to this piece. In other words, we can turn this into a slow, overwhelming, emotional event. Either interpretation works, and this is why this piece is a problem for many pianists. It's easy to get stuck in between tempo approaches because there are benefits and drawbacks to each, but ultimately you will have to make a decision. For many of these preludes, the tempo can be determined from a combination of the rate of harmonic change 
the extremity of chromaticism, and the melodic gestures being employed. We can usually find a nice, comfortable range, which is slow, medium, or fast, and any elements that do not seem to work efficiently within the music can be adjusted for, for the greater good. However, we do occasionally come across preludes that give us clues that point in one direction and clues that point in the opposite. The A minor prelude we looked at a moment ago is in many ways wide open. The clues work both ways equally, so anything goes. But what happens when the clues are a little more specific in their directional hints, causing increased consternation in our interpretive brain? The B major prelude is one such case, where in common time, four beats to a bar. For the first two bars, we can play this at a moderate and leisurely pace, with everything clear and clean, including the ornaments. But, once we get to the next two bars, we have broken chords that seem to go on forever. musical elements that do not sound great at the same tempo. We'd like the opening to be moderate, so we can hear the complex interactions between ornaments and gestures. But the arpeggios afterwards would probably sound a lot better if they were faster. doesn't stop here. In the middle of the piece, we have a lovely string of chromatic scales in the right hand, and quick changes of harmony in the left. This would make us think, okay, we should definitely do a moderate to slow tempo, so this sounds great. But, then right after, Bach goes on a single line journey throughout the lower compass of the instrument. And if we take a slow tempo, then this really empties out musically into meaningless scales. like to revel in the beautiful and thought-provoking sound quality that can be generated here, in my view, these individual scales really should be going a lot faster. There's no point to them otherwise. like this, we usually start out considering the worst-case scenario. In this piece, the worst case occurs with the endless broken chords and the single line scales. We really can't play these bits too slow, or else everything grinds to a halt. If we agree that that is the case, then the next step we take is experimentation with tempi. How slow can it go without being too slow? 
Let's try. I think this is too slow for my taste. When we take this tempo to the scale, we get a similar negative effect. So, let's try it a little faster. That works okay. Does it work for the scales? To an extent. This is where we find a range of tempi that work. We can always go a little faster or a little slower, depending on what elements of the interpretation we want to bring out. For example, if we really want to go on the slow end of tempi possibilities, then we can adjust the scale section to have more meaning than it does on paper. For instance, instead of playing it through straight in time like this, We can take time at the key changes, as a cellist might do in a solo work. Similarly, we can have the same approach in the broken chord sections, but with the added complexity of varying our articulation as well. Instead of this, we can try something like this. It's all interconnected, and there is a lot we can do to make up for subtle problems that may arise from our tempo choice. Similarly, if we want to go on the fast side of things, then we adjust our interpretation accordingly when we reach passages where the tempo is not ideal. For reference, the broken chords seem to do really well at around this tempo. The scales work fine as well. Now, when we apply this to the opening, we have our other worst case scenario. Things sound like a mad rush. You really have to make the ornaments short and use a transparent sound quality so that nothing is obscured. In other words, pedal is not your friend in this case. When you get 
into the middle of the piece, where some interesting chord progressions occur quite fast. Once again, you have to make things transparent and focus on long-held notes. Instead of this... You can have something lighter, like this. The point is, if you're trying to find a tempo within the range between the slowest tempo that works for the fastest music and the fastest tempo that works for the slowest music. Once you have one within this range, then you accommodate for whichever side is the most negatively affected. Simple, yeah? There are a few traps that we can fall into in our search for ideal tempi, and it's important to keep these in mind. First, our preconceptions of Bach's music in general make a big difference when we come across a piece of his that we've never heard or played before. For example, in the historically minded performance aesthetic, that we find in musical communities that are using historical reproductions of instruments, the tempi tend to be faster than what we find with instrumentalists using modern instruments. If you're used to hearing Bach on historical instruments, your preferences for speed will likely fall on the fast side. Similarly, if you're used to hearing Bach on modern instruments, especially from recordings made before 1960, you'll probably be used to slower tempi and your preferences may dictate that. I'm not saying that either is right or wrong. I'm saying that you need to be aware of your own preferences and what these are based on. Another trap that we find in Bach is that we may tend to go faster as we get to know the piece well. And this is related to the issue of boredom I mentioned earlier. The more familiar we are with something, the more predictable it is, and because of this we can go faster because our ears recognize things and take them for granted. If you already know what harmony is coming, then you can focus your listening on articulation, as an example. Nothing can overwhelm us, and the trap that exists is that we lazily begin to assume that our audience is at the same level of familiarity with the piece as we, the performers, are. That they will take elements of the piece for granted, and have the ability to focus on other things that are happening in the piece. It's really interesting in terms of perception. I'm sure many of us know Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Today, in any concert hall, the first movement could be played really, really fast, and most likely, we'd all get it. But imagine if you'd never heard that piece before, and you heard it for the first time really, really fast. You'd almost be thinking, wait, wait for me! We have to remind ourselves that our own familiarity with a piece can lead to boredom of that piece. But the boredom is a separate element, something that is outside the piece and its construction. It is generated by our study of the piece, rather than by inherent weaknesses of the piece. This is why I said earlier that just because we get bored by something doesn't necessarily mean that we have to speed up. There are many potential causes at play. There are other factors that occur which can make tempo selection difficult for us. One common area of debate is what Bach means when he writes cut time. The B-flat minor prelude exhibits this.
is agreed upon with cut time is that there are two beats to a bar. The region of dispute is how fast those two beats should be played. If we play this piece too slow, then we'll hear four beats to a bar instead of two. If that were the only problem, then we could end this by saying right now that we should play this fast. We have two beats, without a doubt, but the texture and rate of harmonic change give us some problems with that. When you have voices moving in scale patterns simultaneously, sometimes in contrary motion, it's possible to get a kind of sonic overload. We don't hear much, and yet we hear too much. On the piano, this is a serious concern, because we have one general sound quality. The opening sounds okay when we only have two voices. But when the third voice enters, playing scales that are sometimes parallel to other voices and sometimes contrary, we have to take a slower tempo so that we can hear what is going on. Anything faster sounds a little too complex, even if we've heard it a thousand times. There's another limiting factor to our speed here. Bach has lots of tide notes, which cause dissonance in special places. I'll play this part slowly, and I'll emphasize the held notes. These are simply beautiful. These held notes increase the complexity level of the harmony. Instead of a simple cadence, like this, we have the tied F, which accounts for the dissonance. If we go too fast, this complexity is entirely lost. In general, the rule of thumb is that you have to play at a speed where the tide dissonance can be perceived. If you can't hear it, you have to slow down. So what does this mean for our concern over what Bach means when he writes cut time? 
Well, it means that we have to find a tempo that is slow enough for these elements to be heard, but fast enough to be perceived as having only two beats to a bar instead of four. Something in this range seems to work well. But this also means that we cannot rely upon any general rule about cut time. That it's always fast, or always twice as fast as we think. The situation is far more complex than that. Occasionally, Bach writes a tempo marking, and for the most part, they are obvious and self-explanatory. The G minor prelude is a perfect case. It's in the style of a French overture, and Bach writes Largo just in case we don't realize what is happening. However, there are occasions when we have to think a little bit about these markings. The B minor prelude is written in cut time, like our previous in-depth example. It's very tempting to play it like this, with a focus on the melodic elements. However, Bach writes Allegro for this movement, which boosts the tempo up significantly and changes the character entirely.
This is an interesting problem. Consider, there are many elements here that would indicate a slower tempo. The rate of harmonic change is moderate to high. Moderate in places like this, high in places like this. And we have areas of complex textures, like here. On the other hand, we have elements that point to a faster tempo, a slow harmonic change rate in the main theme. The written cut time, so we have to feel two in a bar, and the long strings of gestural and harmonic sequences. In other words, it could go both ways. Bach, however, puts his foot down and says, Allegro. This is not only a direction, it's a cautionary direction as well. Not only is he saying, play this fast, he's also saying, don't play it slow. Tempo in Bach is personal. That is not in dispute. You can play these pieces as fast or as slow as you want, and if your interpretation has subtlety, and complexity in its aesthetic elements, then no one will say boo. But it's easy for me to say, your tempo is relatively open. It's much tougher for you to say, I will do this because of these reasons. You always need reasons for how you play a piece, and it's no different than if you're choosing what kind of trill to put somewhere, what kind of pedaling you engage in, or what tempo you want. The more justifications you can find in a piece for your choices, the closer your performance will be to what is written on the page. Also, if you have a watertight interpretation, then even people who disagree with your choices will still be forced to acknowledge that you are a great musician. That's, in the end, how we convince others of our interpretation when we're on stage. So, that's it for this supersized episode of Ask a Pianist. Until next time, keep practicing, and think about the tempo you choose in Bach. Don't rely on performance history or tradition. Start from the music first, and I guarantee that you'll have a strong interpretation by the end. Bye for now.